Amen, church. Can you sing? Blood of Jesus be my all, all my hope and righteousness. In your mercy let me fall, on your grace and nothing less. Hear the sinner's call. Blood of Jesus be my all. Is that your prayer today? Let's pray together, Lord. Thank you for who you are and thank you for just allowing us to understand that it is the blood of Jesus that is our all. Lord, thank you that you not only gave your life for us, but you've given your life to us. And so, Lord, I pray today that the life of Jesus would be manifested from the page to the heart. God, I pray that as we look at your text to us today, Lord, that in the middle of the storms of life, that under all indications, Lord, that it may very well be that you've caused storms to come into our lives to drive us to be dependent upon you. So, Jesus, would you captivate our minds? Would you be honored and glorified in all that is said and decisions that are made and confessions that are made? God, I pray that you would simply allow Jesus Christ to be honored and glorified for your namesake and your namesake alone. Amen. It's been said that you either are in the middle of a storm, you've come out of one, or you're fixing to go into one. And so, today, as we continue through the book of Mark, I want you to understand that Jesus, as we've been walking through this, been, have been dealing with lordship. And then it says, though Mark in chapter 3 begins to deal with this kingdom message. And then in Mark chapter 4, at the, as he begins to close out Mark chapter 4, what he does is he goes through this message and he gives us a parable. And then he begins to deal with the miracles that Jesus is about to perform over the next few chapters of the service of the kingdom to prove that he's the Lord. Does that make sense? And so as it unfolds, Mark in his gospel gives us snapshots and the details very quickly on the, the life and the ministry of Christ. And so today as we begin to look at him being the Lord over the storms or the Lord of the storms, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. So just go ahead and turn to the people to left and right and say, listen up, he's got something for you to hear. Turn to left and right and say this right now. Got it? Good. I want you to understand something. We live in a society that tells you that if everything is going well, you're walking with God. But if everything's going bad, you're living in sin. Well, I'm going to share with you that the Bible is right the opposite of that. As a matter of fact, what I have found in my own personal life, the more I walk with Jesus, the more storms I have. Because what you're about to read, the multitudes not walking with Jesus or going with Jesus but the disciples are. As a matter of fact, the disciples find themselves in a boat in the midst of the storm, listen to me, because they've been obedient to Jesus. In other words, these men are in a boat on the water in a storm because Jesus has told them, let's go to the other side, and because of their obedience, they find themselves in a storm. I'm telling you, Jesus will take you places that make you be dependent upon him. He'll drive you to the place that you won't have any finances, no resources, that you can depend upon yourself, that you must be dependent upon him, and that's the reason it must be his life living through us because we can't, we, he never said we could, and he says he can and always says that he would, and it must be his life, and if you're gonna be a Galatians 2.20, if you're gonna be a person that's no longer you who lives but Christ living in you, you've got to come to the understanding to be expecting storms. Are we all right? So as the Lord, over the last four chapters, we've seen that he's the Lord over the synagogue, right? We've seen that he's the Lord over sickness and Satan. We've seen that he's the Lord over all the, the, the people that have simply began to get together and run their mouths. He's the Lord. Now today we're going to see that he's the Lord of storms of life. Now I'm going to be honest with you, some of y'all run out to the middle of the hurricane. Did you hear me? Because y'all are storm watchers and storm chasers. But I found out a long time ago, if you'll just live for Jesus, the storms will find you. I don't have to look for a fight. Just stand for truth. They'll, they'll find you. Because there's a lot of contemporary churches, when you stand against the majority 
of the world, you're standing against the majority of Christian churches because the world has so invaded the lives of people that call themselves believers, you're going to have to stand against the majority of the church. So in Mark chapter 4, I want you to see a couple things here. It starts out in verse 35. It says, on the same day. Now, as we read this text, I want you to grab your mind and let you understand that it's a continuation. Jesus has been teaching all day. He's been on the seashore. He stood in a boat. He's pushed out from the boat. He's looking at the congregation like I'm looking at you. And he's taught the parables that we've gone through the last four weeks. You got me? You find the parable of Matthew 13, but you find this scenario in Matthew 8 and Luke 8. And you say, Brother Brad, why is Matthew 13 the parable? Well, because Matthew gives a whole lot more detail than Mark does. You got me? And even though they're the synoptic gospels and even though they are dealing with the same uh, truths and same subjects, they, Matthew and Luke and Mark give different details. And so here's what it says. On the same day, come. That's very important. They've been gone all day. When evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. That's very important. What did he tell them? We're going to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, now remember they'd come off the mountain, got down to the seashore, and a great multitude had come again. They couldn't even get inside the house. Y'all remember that whole deal? Are we good? When they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. In other words, they took him in the boat that he was already in, the floating platform, and other little boats were also with him. They all couldn't get in the same boat. So there's more than one boat on this deal. Y'all got me? And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the, sto- he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, y'all remember, he just taught them, hadn't he? The Pharisees just said that, you know, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has committed the unpardonable sin, and he goes through the whole sowing and the reaping and all that stuff. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. I want to, I'm going to cover something that you, that's not going to be in your commentary on this verse right here. And, when the, and, when, and, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, watch this, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have... No faith. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, I would say so, they feared. Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, the English language really does not do a justice to the text that we've just read, okay? Because it makes you think it says something that it really doesn't say. As a matter of fact, for those of you that will be going to Israel, you'll, you'll understand this. I got to preach on the Sea of Galilee. And I didn't realize what I'm sharing with you until they cut the boat off and we sat still in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Nine miles wide, 13 miles long. As you sit on the Sea of Galilee, you can see that it is surrounded by Mount Hermon to the north, Mountains all the way around, and so it's really a bowl. It's 700 feet below sea level. And so as you, as you sit there, you begin to understand things like this. It's the lowest freshwater lake in the world. Okay? It's important because I'm going somewhere with this because you've got to understand what's going on. The people that's in the boats are, are Jews. And so what Jesus is doing, he's been teaching. Here's the question that you've got to ask. Why would Mark... Immediately after te- giving what Jesus taught in the parables, deal with this in the, in the form that he has. I mean, why didn't they go and say, you know, uh, let's deal with a, a miracle of the leper being healed? You understand? I mean, out of all the miracles that they could put in there, he goes right into this. Well, let's talk about it. Y'all ready? First of all, I want us to understand there's, there's four important principles and truths that we need to gather and gain today about the Lord of the storms because I'm telling you, if you're not in a storm, just wait, there's one coming. And I'll tell you something else. You may not go through it, but somebody in your family will go through it and you'll have to be in the boat in the other boat with them. Amen? So the first thing I want you to understand is the time of the storm. What is the timing of the storm? Isn't it amazing that storms always come at the most inopportune time? Can I get a witness, CLA banquet? I mean, it always happened just about church time. 
It always happens just about time for the party to start, you know, and everybody's trying to get there. Amen? Now, watch this. You got to see this. It says, first of all, on the same day, on the same what day? On the same day that he's been standing and teaching about this parable. So it's a continuation. So basically Jesus has stood, gave the parable of the sower, gave the parable of all the the, the seven parables of Matthew 13, and he looks at his disciples and said, let's get away from them. Now, this is important because in just a few chapters, what you're going to find is they've been hanging out with Jesus all day long, and Jesus looks at them and says, feed them. And he feeds the 5,000. They get on the boat, get in the boat, go to the other side, and he says, Feed them, okay? So it's important that you understand these little words right here, that in the same, on the same day, on the same day that he taught this parable, he's about to now show them the importance of what he just taught them. Are we good? Watch this. When evening had come, why is it so important about when evening had come? Y'all listen to me, wait. Because storms don't happen at night on the Sea of Galilee. Did you hear what I just said? There are no storms on the Sea of Galilee at night. There's always storms during the day, wind storms. It's not raining and lightning, but it's wind storms. Why? Because if you look north from, the, it's called the Lake of Gennesaret or the Lake of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee has three different names. It's according to your Hebrew, Greek, or or just flat out Gentile. Does that make sense? So, so here's what happens. If, you, if, you're in, if you're in Tiberias, which is the south part of the Sea of Galilee, and you look north to the Mount of Hermon, or Mount Hermon, to the northwest, there is the, where the, the um, two mountains come together. It's called the Valley of the Doves. If you walk through the Valley of the Doves, it takes you to Nazareth, which is Jesus' hometown. It's about a three days journey by foot from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee. And the reason it's called the Valley of Doves, because the wind, as it comes off the Mediterranean Sea, is funneled through there and it coos like doves. I don't think it's by accident that when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, that there was a symbol of the Holy Spirit come down as the form of a dove. Why? Because the Jews understood the cooing of a dove. And so what would happen is all, all day, pretty much every day, when there would be a cold front or a warm front come through, that the winds off the Mediterranean would begin to push and be funneled into the Sea of Galilee. And so there was always a windstorm. You know when else there was a windstorm? It's when Jesus walked on the water. So it's, a, it's, an, important, it's an important understanding to understand that the reason these fishermen was upset, they'd seen a windstorm plenty of times. It just wasn't the right time. Is anybody listening to what I'm telling you? When evening had come, the day has been far spent. Jesus pushes off the bank, and he tells them, we're going to go to the other side. Just so you'll know, every time, every time, every time, put it in your Bible, every time Jesus says the other side is to the, it's on the other side where the Gadarene demoniac is. It's to the Gentile side. Every time they, he says, let's go to the other side, it's always going to be on the east side over where the Gentiles and the pigs are. Do you get me? So when he's at the gather in the Moniac and he says, let's go to the other side, he's not talking about going to back over to where he fed the 5,000. You got me? So as you're studying your Bible and you come in the Gospels and you hear, and we went to the other side, it always means that they're going to go to the east side of the Sea of Galilee to where the Gentiles hung out. He fed 5,000 Jews, possibly 10 to 15,000 on one side, and when they got to the other side, He fed 4,000, which is very important because he did the same miracle on both sides, proving that Jew and Gentile both have the same Lord. You got me? So let's just walk through this. So what is the setting of the day? Well, the setting of the day is on the other side. And so as we, next week, we're going to look at what happens when the boat slides up on the bank. There's a dude that lives in the tombs. There's a dude that's cutting himself. There's a dude that is demon-possessed. So you can imagine that the Jews, number one, didn't want to go to the other side. I mean, here's the disciples. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Could you imagine, could you imagine those guys going, why would we want to go over there? I mean, that's, that's crossing the railroad tracks. Why would we want to go to that side of the neck of the woods? 
We're Jews. They're not. That's the reason in just a few weeks you're going to hear the Pharisees now look at Jesus and call him a Samaritan because he's mixing with the Gentiles. We just come out of he's been called a demon and that he's Beelzebub. Just wait. In just a few weeks they're going to call him a Samaritan. And so what is the setting? Well, the setting of the day is it's been a long day. The sun's going down. Jesus pushes off the bank, tells his disciples we're going to the other side. Could you imagine the disciples going, oh, I really don't want to go to the other side, but I guess because we're, you know, he's done pulled us out among the, all the rest of them, I guess we better start paddling. And so with all confidence, listen, with all confidence, these disciples got into the boat and they're going to the other side. Jesus goes down into the bottom of the boat and he begins to go to sleep because it's been a long day of preaching and teaching. And a storm comes. So let's deal with the teachings in the storm. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ the Lord? Absolutely. Does he have omniscience? Yes, he does. Is he all-knowing? Yes, he is. Did Jesus know, standing on the bank, before he got in the boat, the storm was coming? Did Jesus know how they would respond before they got in the boat? Yes. I want you to hear me. The storm may catch you by surprise, but it'll never catch the Lord by surprise. And when you're in the midst of a storm, you need to stop and turn around and look and say, okay, Lord, what is it? You got me? Now watch this. So let's talk about the teachings. Here's what, this, this is what will blow your mind, and it will bring it all together when the disciples said what they said. Y'all ready? You do understand who's in charge of the whole land the time that Jesus is walking. It's the Romans. And so what's happened is, is in the synagogue, not only are the Pharisees lording over people, but now this Greek mythology has moved in and all this scientific worshiping of all things and all gods has been brought into the religious system even with the Pharisees. You got me? So here's what the, the Jew believes even today. If you get on a boat in Israel with a Jew, they're afraid of three things. Y'all ready? And every one of us is about Greek mythology. Here it is. The tradition of the day believed in the three, three Greek gods of deity. Three of them. Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades. Y'all recognize that Hades word, don't you? So here, here's what's going on. They believe, y'all ready? The Jews believe that in the Sea of Galilee, in the depths of the Sea of Galilee, lives the God of Hades. Why? Because at the mouth of the Jordan River, there's a place called the Gates of Hades. It's a real place. Matthew 16 is not some figment of Jesus' imagination when he looks and says, who do men say that I am? It's the Gates of Hades. Why? Because the God of Zeus is worshipped there. We good? And the Jordan River starts at the bottom of that mountain, and it flows southward, and the first body of water it comes to is the Sea of Galilee. It flows through the Sea of Galilee, out the south part of the Sea of Galilee, flows another few miles and ends in a place called the Dead Sea. And so the Jews, even though the Jordan River is a source of water, it's only a source of water from the gates of Hades to the Sea of Galilee. You can't drink the water from there down. That's the reason the Jordan River is so significant in the Old Testament. That's the reason the Jordan River is so significant in the New Testament. That's the reason when Naaman was told to go dip himself in the Jordan seven times, he said, I'm not getting in that nasty water. Why? Because he'd been taught that the water was wicked. You good? Now watch this. So what happened was when the windstorm became prevalent, Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat. We good? The disciples, who are four, at least four fishermen in the boat, they knew how to handle the storm. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? 
but they didn't know how to handle this storm. And so immediately their brains begin to engage this philosophy that the three brothers are fighting. Now you understand why they go, who is this man? That even the God of the winds and the God of the sea and the God of Hades tremble. You got to get it, because if you don't get it, you'll never get it. So the Jordan River, as it begins to flow to the Sea of Galilee, look at what the text says. Here's what Mark says. Mark says that they've pushed off, and as they've pushed off, Jesus goes to sleep in the bottom of the boat. He's got his head on a pillow, and what does the Bible say that the water's doing? It begins to beat against the boat, and it begins to do what? It begins to fill the boat, right? It's important that you understand the philosophy of the Jews and these fishermen. So, the teaching of the storm, the traditions is that these three brothers are fighting. Now, about nine weeks ago, I stood on this platform and I told you that Mark was always about explaining the three places that Jesus is the Lord. In the natural, in the human and in the supernatural. And what you have in this text is all three elements touched. You got the response of the human response of the disciples. You got the supernatural response of the Lord Jesus in his deity. And then you got the natural of the wind and the waves. Y'all good? So, in the midst of this traditional of the teaching, you'll find now, here comes the terror because of the tradition. What's happened? They're looking at a situation that they thought they really knew what was going on, but they really didn't see it the way Jesus saw it. What's happened? What has Jesus told them they're doing? Work with me. He told them they're going where? That means you're not going to drown. Now, you may have to swim the last 55 meters to the bank, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus has told you that you're going to the other side. So there's a lot of truths that we need to pull out of here, and I don't have time to pull all of it out, but let me just say this. If you believe Christianity is always going to be sunshine, you don't have the Jesus of the Bible. As a matter of fact, from this day forward, everything these disciples came in contact with was conflict and fighting all the time. And they were being obedient to Jesus. So, let's look at the terror. See, the suddenness of this storm surprises them. Why? Because it's nighttime and it's not time for a storm. Are we good? Everybody good? Happy Mother's Day. We good? The suddenness of the storm, it just it, it, it blows in. Here's what it says. Verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already feeling but he, Jesus, was in the stern. He was in the, he, listen, he wasn't about the storm. He was about resting and sleeping. So here comes the terror. What is the terror? Well, first of all, I want you to understand that these disciples, before they go wake up, Jesus has done everything they possibly know to do out of their experience factor. Do you hear what I just said? They've raised the sail. They've lowered the sail. They've turned the rudder. They've done everything they know to do. They've paddled. They're toiling. They're working in their own power and in their own strength. And finally, somebody makes a motion in a business meeting and says, I make a motion, we go wake up Jesus. Because we've done everything that we know how to do. We've done everything to accomplish how to fight the wind. But this wind and this storm is different than anything Peter, James, and John had ever been a part of. I don't think it's by accident. Amen? And Jesus is driving these men to understand who he is and to be dependent upon him just like the plagues in Egypt was going to cause the children of Israel to be dependent upon who God is. So the storms in your life, some of y'all have made some bad choices and you've made your own storm. But there's some of you sitting in this room, you're going through the storms of life and you're constantly asking God, why are you in the midst of the storm? It's because he wants you to draw near to him and see him. So with that being said, 
you see the grumbling of the disciples. Now, this is what's amazing. These disciples have just heard this parable and that he's the Lord over all. And what do they do? After they work themselves to death, they don't know what else to do, they go wake up Jesus. Boy, that sounds like a lot of people in this room. You've tried to fix it all week, and now you're at your wit's end, and now you think you can just run down to the church and get it fixed. Why don't you just go ahead and hang out with Jesus and trust the word? Amen? So here's what they do. They come, and they basically accuse Jesus of being careless. Don't you care? It, do, do you not know what's going on? I could just imagine Jesus standing up going, apparently y'all boys don't understand. Because back there, I told you was going to the other side. You say that I'm the Lord and nothing catches me by surprise. It may catch you by surprise and it may come on you suddenly. And you may not understand everything, but I'm telling you right now, I'm the Lord, Jesus says, right? So they begin to grumble. Now watch this. The words that Mark uses, he uses two words that I think you guys need to, need to really understand. The first word that he uses when they come to Jesus, verse 38, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Here's the two words they use. Y'all ready? First of all, the mood of being angry. They're mad at Jesus. Don't you care? That's the mood of the verb. When they came to Jesus, they woke him up and said, Lord, don't you care? They don't even go together. Did you hear what I just said? Mark or Luke says, they say, Lord, don't you care? That don't even go together. How can you say, Lord, don't you care? It's like saying, no, Lord. Those two things don't go together. Because if he's the Lord, he cares. And if he's the Lord, you can't say no. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? And so the Bible says that they begin to rebuke him because he's asleep. But not only do you find them angry, the second emotion that you find in their lives is they're afraid. Now let me just say this, y'all ready? The reason is most of y'all in this room are afraid because you can't control it anymore. Most of us in this room do not get afraid as long as we can control it. That's the reason some of y'all are scared of heights. You're not scared of heights, you're scared of falling. You are scared that you can't hold yourself up. That's like people say, I'm scared of flying. You're not scared of flying, you're scared of crashing. Flying's pretty good. That crashing thing ain't too good. Are y'all listening? So what, we get afraid when we can't control it. So these disciples have told, they, they, they've, they've done all they know to do. They've done everything in their human power. And there's a supernatural in the natural causing the natural to see the supernatural. You got me? They're afraid. Lord, don't you care? Watch this. We're dying. God, I'd rather go back to the multitudes and let the Pharisees stone us. I don't want to drown. Don't you care? Look at the next verse. Y'all ready for this? Here's, the, here, here's what the, the intent of the text says. And the Lord stood. Y'all ready? And he rebuked their rebuke. Now the English says that he rebuked the wind. But that's not the context of the passage. What it literally means is to be muzzled. Now, the English writers translated it that said that Jesus stood up and told the wind to be muzzled and the water to be muzzled. No, what he told the disciples is to shut your mouth. I'm the Lord. And as he's speaking to the heart of the angry disciples, the wind and the waves overhear and obey. You go, Brother Brad, why is that significant? Because then just next week, when they slide up on the bank, there's a dude going to come screaming, running down the bank, full of demons, and the demons recognize who Jesus is. In the synagogue, 
before they ever got into the boat, as he's teaching in the church, the man that had the demons recognized who Jesus was. And yet, the winds and the waves, here it is, the God of the winds and the God of the waves and the God of the depths recognize the Lordship of Christ and the disciples don't. And as he stood and he began to rebuke the anger and their rebuke, he's rebuking their rebuke. Look at what he says. How is it that you still have no faith? After everything I've taught you, after everything that you've seen, after everything that you've experienced, how is it that you still have no faith? I love how Matthew records this in Matthew chapter 8 because what you find is a, a Roman centurion before this happens. The Roman centurion is making his way to the multitude and he basically has a servant that's sick, y'all remember? And here's what Jesus says about the servant, the Roman, the Gentile. On the other side, he says, how great a faith he has. In this scenario, they're in the boat and he looks at his disciples and goes, how little faith you have. So you either have no faith or little faith and both of them doesn't amount to anything. Now I was raised in the country and they said, well, as long as you got a little bit of faith, you're okay. No, what's good, what, what is that good for? Because if you have a little faith, then you got faith in something else greater than what you have the little faith in. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? So what had to happen was, is God had to get these disciples away from their human experience and being fishermen. I'm a fisherman. Who do you think you are? I can drive the boat. You're just a carpenter. And when they was at the end of their rope, they go wake up Jesus and they're angry and they're afraid because they're in a storm. Here's what's amazing. Jesus is not even bothered by the storm, but he's bothered by their lack of faith. Did y'all get it? So, I want you to look at the progression of their fear. What is their fear? Well, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Some of you sitting right on the edge of the seat, and you're wanting Jesus to do something in your life, but you won't turn a loose because you're afraid he may make you go somewhere that you don't want to go. He may, make you, he may make you go to somebody you don't want to go to. You want God to use you in your box. You want God to do something in your life this morning so it leaves you alone but gives you the appearance of being holy and godly. Did y'all hear what I just said? So, as the, listen, they were intimidated by the storm, but by the time you get to verse 41, they're not afraid of the storm anymore. They're afraid of the Savior. Because they go, who is this? He just rebuked the fire out of me, and they got in on the overflow. Y'all ready for this? I want you to hear me. You keep working. You just keep working. You keep sweating. You keep trying and, and not trusting. Your boat's going down. Your boat's going to keep getting filled with water until you wake up enough to go, I need to go with Jesus. Jesus never promised you smooth sailing. But there's a lot of people that come down to the altar and they think that Jesus is going to fix it and they don't have to have any consequences to their sin. I'm just telling you right now, the Lord Jesus is the Lord and he causes storms to come into my life to knock me out of me so that I can get to where I need to be at his feet going, who is this? God, I can't. You never said I could. God, you said you could. And always said you would. Christianity is not tough. Christianity is not hard. Christianity is impossible. The only person that can live the life that pleases the Father is the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that being said, let's go to point number three. It's the triumph of the Savior. The disciples find themselves in awe of the confidence of Jesus, even in the midst of him saying that he was careless. Amen? But yet Jesus is amazed by the disciples' fear and faithlessness. And so you find here that Mark uses this word that we get mega from in the Greek. He uses it in three different times. Here's what it is in this chapter. Y'all ready? The first time he uses it is he calls it a great storm. It was a mega storm. 
Then it says that when Jesus rebuked the disciples, there was a mega calm. Here's what's amazing, Brother Jeff. Everything got calm but the disciples. Did y'all hear what I just said? See, they got mesmerized by the storm, and then they was mesmerized by the calming because what they was asking Jesus for, he did it, and then they weren't even expecting him to do anything. So there was a mega storm, there was a, a mega calm, and in verse 41 it says that they had great fear. They feared exceedingly. It's mega there. See, they still didn't know who he was. You say, well, Brother Brad, were they saved? No, I don't believe they were saved. They were just followers. They was in the boat with him, but they didn't know him, which is three-fourths of the people sitting in this room. You go, Brother Brad, are you the only one saved? No, we just come out of the parable. Only three-fourths get the, get the seed. There's only a fourth that bear fruit. Amen? Y'all got me? Are we good? Because Judas is in this boat. Peter, who would be the one that would warm himself by the world's fire and deny Jesus three times that even cussed to a little, to a little servant girl. Now, what we want to do is we want to say that when Jesus called him to himself that they were saved. I'm telling you right now, Jesus called him to himself to prove who he was. Salvation didn't come till later. Well, Brother Brad, I don't like that. Well, how are you going to explain Judas? That he hung out with everybody, healed folks, preached, did all the stuff, but yet went to hell. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Jesus called him the son of perdition. We all right. So there was a great storm, there was a great calm, and then there was a great fear. So you're in the midst of your storm. I want to ask you a question. If God broke through today, showed you who he was, what's going to happen to you? He can calm everything around you, but listen to me. He never wants you not to be upset. He's got to shake you well before he uses you because you've got sediments that fall to the bottom, and you can't be what you ought to be until he shakes you up. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying in this room? So the triumph of the Savior. I, I, want you to, I want you to see this. Watch this. Y'all ready? First of all, they forgot his presence. Here's what's crazy. I'd a whole lot rather be in a boat in a storm with Jesus than with the multitude on the bank being disobedient. Are we all right? There's five of y'all going. I'm following you, Brother Brad. The rest of y'all looking down. Them muffins are working on you? What does the Bible say? He was in the boat with them. Now, they would have an excuse if he was on the bank and the storm came and he didn't do anything, but he's right there in the midst of it. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I don't care what storm you're going through right now. If Jesus Christ lives on the inside of you, he's with you, he's in you, there's absolutely nothing that's going on in your life that has not come by the ordained hand of God. It had to come through the filtered hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we may not like it, but I'm telling you right now, he's promised you you're going to the other side, and however he's going to take you out of here, you're going to the other side. It's the lordship of Jesus Christ in the boat. So we're going to prove it. He's with them, amen? I promise you, you're going to have storms in your life. You're going to have storms of disappointments. You're going to be disappointed in me. You're going to be disappointed in yourself. You're going to be disappointed in people around you. You're going to be disappointed in all things. You know why? Because that's the ministry of disappointment. God makes you disappoint. You, listen to me. God will never be who he needs to be in you until he can disappoint you and the people that you're following closer than him. He'll disappoint you in your kids. He'll disappoint you in your spouse. You go, well, what? why? Because you're trusting and following them more than you are him. I've, I'm, I've, I've watched this. I've been here 22 years. I've watched mamas and daddies pray for kids, and then their kids become their idols. You better be very careful because the Lord Jesus can take them as quick as he can give, gives them. Are y'all listening? You're going to have storms in your life. You're going to have the storms of disappointment. When things don't turn out the way you think they ought to turn out, not only are you going to have storms of disappointment, you're going to have storms of doubts. You're going to doubt. You're going to, you, you're going to go through times in your life that you don't know which ends up. 
See, the storm, <laughs> Brother Greg, are you ready for this? Are, are y'all okay? The storms had nothing to do with the stinking disciples. It had everything to do with Jesus. He knew that it had to take a storm in their lives to get them beyond what they physically, humanly possibly could do, get them to the end, go, Lord, I don't know what else to do. And so Jesus stands and proves himself in the midst of the storm. And so here's the deal. If you're in the middle of a storm, why don't you learn the lesson? See, the storm had nothing to do about the faith the disciples had everything to do about the capability and the opportunity of Jesus. Because up until this point, they didn't have to rely or or respond to who Jesus is. Is anybody listening to me? Amen? He's trustworthy when you don't know how to trust. Amen? Amen? In the midnight hour when the storms of life come and you don't know how to explain it away and all you got to hold on to is Jesus as he holds on to you because you can't even grip anything anymore. You don't know who, listen, you don't know who he is until you can't get what you always had. Amen? Not only are you going to have storms of disappointments and storms of doubt, let me tell you all this. You're going to have storms of disturbances. There's going to be things that ain't going to go your way. I mean, you're going to have your day planned tomorrow, and it's going to be a Monday every day this week. It's going to be a Monday on Tuesday and a Monday on Wednesday. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever had one of those weeks? Every time you turn around, it's a Monday. And constantly, everything that you got on your calendar and everything that you're planning, there's disturbances. Here's what I've, I hadn't learned, but I'm beginning to figure it out. Y'all hear me? There's a lot of times the Lord disturbs me because I've planned a lot of things he's not in. And what he's doing is he's causing some water to come over the boat going, all right, dude. Y'all good? Not only is there going to be storms of disappointments and storms of doubt and storms of disturbances, there's going to be storms and detours. Sometimes you get detoured. Amen? Listen, I went to go pick up the team the other day from Alaska. I left two and a half hours early because I was going to study Y'all hear me? I was going to finish up my studying and gather my stuff together and polish the sermon, get it all knocked down. You know, I was going to go to the, to the cell phone waiting, had my phone, had everything. I had it all planned out. I get to 840, and the traffic's backed up because some brilliant dude in Nashville decided to shut all four lanes of 65 down, 65 north. Did y'all hear what I just said? For construction. Now, I'm not a very smart man, but I think you need to have one lane open. So they begin to detour everybody. Well, guess what happens? When everybody gets detoured, the whole detour needs to be detoured. Are y'all with me? So I finally, I texted Kyle. I knew they were in the, in the air, and I knew he'd get it when he landed. I said, hey, bro, text me when you land. I'm trying to get there. So I put it in my GPS and that English, British talking girl took me all the way through all these things and I finally got there. Pretty, pretty close to the time. I'm gonna tell you what, there's nothing that frustrates me more than detours. Because I didn't have it planned. Amen? It wasn't in my agenda to spend two more hours riding around. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? Now let me tell you what Satan will do to you. Satan will detour you till you run out of gas. I was delivering in South Alabama. I had to go to Enterprise and deliver a, a water pump to a turf farm. And I was driving down this little county road, and out in the middle of a field sat a BMW. Did you hear what I just said? Now, I'm not a very smart man, but immediately there were bells that went off in my head that went, that BMW shouldn't be in the middle of the field. Y'all good? Y'all with me? And so I pulled off the side of the road, got out, walked out there, and there was a lady in the car. I said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? She said, yes, sir. I said, can you tell me why you got your BMW out in the middle of a field? Promise y'all, here's her response. I'm looking 
for a gas station. I said, okay. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. I said, ma'am, there ain't no gas station in Millis Field. She said, yeah, but what you don't understand is my gas light came on and I don't know where I'm going. I'm on this little country road and I passed the only gas station and the thing got to, the bell got to dinging and I pulled off on this dirt road way back there and I've been riding down this dirt road and it wound up right here and I'm out of gas. And I'm just so glad you could see me. See, the, the Lord wants you to understand that sometimes you're going to run slap out of gas in a detour because you've been working in your own power. You've been working in your own strength. Some of you are going to be going through a storm of delay. You're going to be delayed. You know, when you're driving down the road and they're working on the shoulder of the road and they got a pace car, that's what I call them, that leads people around. Isn't it amazing that when you're sitting there delayed that the guy on the other end is the most ignorant individual? You know, one dude's flipping the stop and slow sign. Why don't he just let us go? Ain't nothing coming. Because you can't see what's coming over three hills. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? Listen, you can't see what's going on tomorrow, but there's a man who sits at the right hand of God the Father who is our advocate, who is the Lord God. He knows what's coming. Why don't you just trust him? Because you'll sit in here and say he's the Lord, but by the time you walk out of this room, you're gonna take control and you're gonna go, okay, God, I'm, I'm in control now. I'll raise the sails. I'll drop the sails. You're the carpenter. I'm the, I'm the dude that can run the ship. So his presence with, with him, amen? But not only do you find the triumph of the Savior in his presence, number two, you find the triumph of him in his position. Jesus is asleep, he's resting. I wanna ask you a question. Did Jesus want them in the midst of chaos or did he want them in calmness? See, what he wanted them to be is he wanted them to be in, the, in, in, in chaos, but he wanted them to be calm in the chaos. So here's the deal. Come unto me, all the heavy laden and burden, and I'll give you rest. See, the problem that we have in American church is we know how to work it. We know how to make everything look good, and so therefore we don't know how to rest. And then we get mad when people can rest. Rest in him and rest with him. Rest in the word that you're going to get to the other side. And then just go down and go to sleep. See, if you go to sleep, you, you, you wouldn't know it would be storming anyway. Did y'all hear what I just said? Not only do you see the triumph of the, of the Savior in his presence and his position, but don't you see his power? Y'all ready? Jesus is the strong man of Mark 3, 27. It's a continuation. When they said, he's Beelzebub, here's what it says in Mark 3, 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. That means the man that's the strong man has to be stronger than the strong man. So in the minds of the Jews that was in that boat going, it's Poseidon, it's Hades, it's Zeus. And they go, what kind of man is this? And Jesus goes, how is it that you still have no faith? He's sovereign over creation. Who is this man that even the wind and the sea obey? See, Jesus didn't have to rebuke the wind and the sea because the wind and the sea was doing exactly what Jesus wanted the wind and the sea to do. Some, some of you guys are praying for God to change his circumstance, and if he changed his circumstance, then his will wouldn't get done in your life because he brought the circumstance in your life to knock you out of you so that he can see that you need him more than you need the circumstance. Did y'all get that? So here's the deal, ride the waves. You're going to the other side. So here's what we find. We find the disciples waking Jesus up in the midst of the storm. But in a few short chapters, they get so com comfortable with Jesus, Jesus has to wake them up in the garden. 
See, there's two types of people that need to be woke, woke up in this morning. Those who think they're saved, but they're really lost. And those that are saved, but they've gone to sleep. The presence of the Lord, the position of the Lord, his power. But the last point I want to give you, and I'm going to bring a conclusion here, is don't you forget the promise of the Lord. We're going to go to the other side. We may have to go through the jungle. We may have to fight hell by the acre. Did you hear me? It won't be smooth sailing. But when evening had come, he said, let's go to the other side. Acts chapter 27. I want us to read these verses. and This is just in conclusion. I'm not, I'm not going to preach another sermon. But I want to bring it home scripturally for you. The more you work in your strength, the more water is going to get in the boat. Acts chapter 27. Is, this is a reality of what I'm trying to get you to understand today. The life of the Apostle Paul. Paul stood on the bank and he told me, he said, now boys, we don't need to go. You got me, Brother Jeff? We don't need to go. I done watched the seven-day forecast. Channel 4 told me it's coming up a cloud. Anybody understand that terminology? It's, one more, it's coming up a cloud. And so this guy stands up on the boat and he goes, I know better than you and I'm telling you, it's going to be a great time because the wind's going to blow and we're going to get to where we're going faster because of the wind. We're going to use it to our advantage. Paul says, let me tell you, boys, you're going to lose life and your cargo. I'm just telling you. So Paul gets on the boat with them. They go anyway. That's what this whole chapter is. I'm going to start in verse 20 because I want to show you a couple things. Y'all ready? Going on with what we're talking about tonight or today. Starting in verse 20. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, listen, it happened exactly what Paul said. They out in the middle of the, of the sea, they hadn't seen the sun nor the stars. That means day and night for many days. It's been a cloud for quite some time. And no small tempest beat on us. In other words, it started dying down. It started to be calm and calm. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They finally gave up. We're dead. We're dead in the water. There's the statement. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. I'm telling some of you mamas and daddies, you need to listen. And it's like watching a train wreck. They'll come to the altar on Sunday morning, won't come back Sunday night and Wednesday night. And so whatever happened at the altar on Sunday morning must not have been good enough to get them here Sunday night and Wednesday night. And so they're teaching their kids that they can just play games. And then when their kids are acting like, a, like they do, just away from here, they want us to fix it. Playing games. I now urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now watch this. For there stood by me a, this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. That's what he says. He's witnessing to him. God's done told me. Saying, here's the word. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Here's the promise of God. Don't be afraid. Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. Listen, this is going to have to happen. Paul, you're going to have to walk through shipwreck, but you're going to go get to stand before Caesar, so you're not going to die in the midst of the shipwreck. You got it? And indeed, God has granted you, all those who sail with you, life. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, verse 26, we must run aground on a certain island. We're going, we're going, it's, we're going to bottom out. Now, God's going to handle it, but you're going to have a rough ride. Anybody listening? Watch verse 27. Now, when the 14th night, y'all got me? Two weeks, Brother Mike. They've been fighting a storm for two weeks. Could you imagine not eating, being worn slap out in the midst of a storms of life? 14 days had come as we're driven up and down the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, the sailors sensed that there was a drawing near some land, and so they began to 
send out the signal and listen to the echo coming back. Look at what verse 28. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. So they'd gotten five fathoms closer to the land. You're getting close. Watch this. Then fearing, lest what? What does it say? That we're going to run aground on the rocks. Now listen, Paul done told them they're going to have to run up on the bank. What'd they do? They dropped four anchors. Are you listening? I just gave you the four anchors that you had to drop. The presence of God, the position of God, the power of God, and the promise of God. And they dropped four anchors. And when the morning came and the sun rose and the calming and the clearing after 14 days of fighting. Are we good? I want you to hear me. Some of you sitting in this room, you dropped your anchor a long time ago and it wasn't one of those four. It wasn't a God anchor. You dug your heels in and said, God, I'm not moving any further. They wronged me. They can come to me. And bitterness has eaten you up because you have an unforgiven spirit. And God has sent storm after storm after storm after storm into your life and you just kept getting bitter and bitter and bitter and bitter and bitter instead of just going waking up Jesus. Are we good? If you're going to drop an anchor today, it better be one of those four. I love what Hebrews 6, 19 says. Put that up there. That went in my notes. I love what Hebrews 6, 19 says. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Brother Tim Scott, and that anchor's sure and steadfast. When you're in the midst of a storm and you don't know which ends up, you don't know which way the wind's blowing, and you're chasing your stinking tail because you're in a whirlwind. There's a four anchor truth that you can drop down and you can rest in the Lord. Some of you in this room, you forgot the promise of God that you're going to the other side. And you've told and you've strained and you've struggled and you've strutted around and you've sweated and you've done all you could do in your own stinking power and all along God's could just continue to let the winds blow against you, continue to let your boat get filled up with water because you are trying instead of trusting. Are we good? Now some of you guys are in the wrong boat. Some of you guys think that you, you can just paddle along next to Jesus and you're okay. You better get in the boat with Jesus because if I'm going down, I'm going down with him. The last time I went to Romania, I got on a plane in Atlanta, Georgia. I was by myself. It was on a 747-400, which means there was four chairs on one side, eight in the middle, and four on the other side. And it never fails. Anytime I'm flying international, there's always a, you know, a kid that's got sinus infections or something. He's going to scream the whole time because his ear, head's about to explode when he get up in about 40,000 feet. You know, everybody's sitting around doing their deal. And so I'm sitting there, and there was a, there was a Jewish a rabbi Across the aisle from me, there's a guy sitting next to me that he was, told me he was a staunch Catholic. There's a guy sitting on the other side of me. He just flat out told me he was an atheist. There's a guy sitting in front of me, and here's what he said. He said, so what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going on a mission trip. I'm a pastor, and I'm going to go teach pastors. And He said, oh, you're one of those guys. I said, I don't know what one of those guys are, but I guess I am. I said, which one of those are you? He said, well, you know now, I, I believe the Bible. And so then he gives me the list of sins that he, he believes won't send him to hell. Y'all know those folks. I just don't believe if a man does this, he's going to go to hell. He went through this. I'll just let him go. So we take off. The pilot comes on. He says, ladies and gentlemen, about two hours into the flight, we're going we're gonna to experience some pretty rough weather. Just want to give you the heads up. Well, the problem was is apparently the front had moved and it was a little quicker than two hours. 
the little flight attendants was going around and pouring coffee in everybody's cup and kind of pushing the little deal. And we hit turbulence and coffee came out of the cup. Y'all understand what I just said? One of the flight attendants' head hit the roof of the plane. That's how, far, that's how quick we fell. The pilot came on. I mean, it said ding, 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 ding. Put your seatbelt on. Y'all understand? And so the flight attendants run. I'm sitting two, two rows from the back of the plane. The flight attendants run, sets down, puts his, his, it's a male, puts his seatbelt on it. So I'm, I'm like right here talking to him. And for the next hour and 10 minutes, we were doing this. And I was hearing death screams. It was completely silence. 35 minutes into it, the rabbi, priest, looked at me and said, young man, don't you think it's time to pray? I got a Jew on the hook. The barber's bobbing up and down. <laughs> the dude that was a professed atheist said, yeah, I think you need to pray too. I said, you don't even believe who I'm going to be praying to, so what difference does it make for you? And the guy that was sitting in front of me literally turned his head around. He said, preacher, will you please start praying? Because for the first time in all three of those men's lives, they can control any of it. And so my response was, I mean, I, in my flesh, I just want to go, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> but my, here's my response. I said, gentlemen, you trusted this pilot when you got on the plane. And you trusted the mechanics that worked on this plane. And you trusted that this plane was going to hold together. Now, I don't know if this plane's going to hold together or not. And the flight attendant said, I don't know how much longer it's going to hold together either. That's when I got scared. When the flight attendant goes, whoa, oh, I, and then I'm, it's, it's on. Y'all understand? In the midst of the conversation, the little air mask thing falls down. Y'all know that stuff y'all don't ever pay attention to? Pull it, put it on your head before everybody, you know, that whole deal. The mask falls down. I'm telling you, it was a rough ride. And so this is all I need to do. I said, Lord, I raised both hands. I said, Lord, if you want to kill 400 people on this plane to bring you on in glory and I'll be one of it, then amen. What a way to go. I'm going to tell pastors about Jesus. The rabbi looked at me. He said, you mean that, don't you? I said, yes, sir, I do. Because the Bible says absent from the body is present with the Lord. Now, do I love my boys and my wife, and do I love New Prospect? Yeah, I'd love to see them again, but you know what? What a way to go. When we landed in Germany, the guy that was an atheist came up to him, and he said, um, you're weird. I said, well, I've been called worse, but why am I weird? Here's what he said. He said, I know you was a little uneasy because everybody was a little uneasy, including the pilot. He said, but everybody that was in our section was scared to death. And it was as though it didn't bother you. I said, sir, let me tell you something. I'm not scared of death because when I was 13 years old, I died. He said, do what? I said, on August the 24th, 1986, I died. He said, well, you're living. I said, no, you don't understand. I died. I said, I died when Jesus died. And I live because he lives. And if he wants to take me out, then he's going to take me out. But I don't fear death no more. I don't even fear the storms. Do I like them? No. But he's told me I'm going to the other side. I'm going to the other side. And so when the storm comes, Brother Butch, I just have to start throwing four anchors out till the sun shines and the sky's clear. And when I don't understand... I hold on to the truth that I do know, that his position, his promise, his power, and his presence will hold me because I can never hold myself. 
Some of y'all need to drop four anchors today. You've been toiling and fighting for quite some time. Some of y'all are afraid and angry. And you said, God, you don't care. Oh, yes, he does. God knew when he got you in the boat in the midst of the storm how you would respond. So you're not going to surprise Jesus on how you're going to respond today. But would you just simply thank him for the storms? Hold me till the storm passes by in the hollow of your hand. And God, if you want to leave me in the midst of a storm until people can see you in me, as long as you get glory and honor out of it, then bring on the waves. Because the only way you're going to be honored and glorified is I got to be more dependent on you than I'm on anything else in this world. Where are you today? You're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're going into a storm. But I got great news. We have a triumphal Savior that if you'll throw four anchors out, it may take more than, than 14 days. It may take 14 years. But the day's going to come when the sun is going to shine and the clouds are going to move. And you'll hear, well done, my true and faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord, would you bring the calmness in the midst of the storm? But Lord, for some in this room that are calm, you need to bring the storm. But Lord, in the midst of the storm is where you prove yourself. So Lord, would you prove yourself in the midst of the storm. So Jesus, would you be Jesus in us? Would you be Jesus to us? That you may be Jesus through us. So Lord, would you be honored and glorified today? Nobody looking around. I want to ask you this question. Can you drop and pray today? That's what Paul did. He dropped four anchors and prayed. Daddies with your family, can you drop and pray? Mamas with your kids, can you drop and pray? In the midst of the storm, can you rest with Jesus? Because the Lord's desire today is to get you to a place that you depended upon Him and that He's the Lord. As these folks begin to sing and you simply need to respond, Brother Jaime's here, Brother Kyle's here, the altar's open. Would you come and simply do business with the Lord? And would you allow the Lord to wake you up this morning? Amen? As they sing, would you simply respond? Your blood speaks a better word than all the ends of flames. Turn upon the sun, speaks righteousness for me. And it stands in my defense. Jesus is your blood. Church, when you get to this point that you can stand and sing, I'm going to invite you again to stand and sing. Testifies of grace. It tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Lord, don't you care? Now boldly we approach. I promise you he cares. He knows. Lord, you don't know what shape I'm in. Yes, he does. Lord, you don't know what storm I'm in. Yes, he does. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? There's nothing but your blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can wash us pure as snow? sing anymore, I want to encourage you. Are you ready?
the storm in your life has been heaven sent, not hell granted. And the storm that's in your life is trying to point you to whose presence you're in. And I promise you, until you get to the place to go, God, I can't. You'll walk out there going, God, you don't care. I tell you, he does. I tell you, he does. Brother Brad, do you ever get shook up? You're doggone right. Let me tell you, when I get shook up, folks, it's in the midst of the storm and I'm looking at the wind and the waves instead of looking at the stern as my Savior rests. The exact same thing is going to happen to Peter in just a few short chapters when he got out of the boat and he took his eyes off the Lord and he forgot the word. He sunk. I'm telling you, there's a bad moon on the rise. CCR. It's coming. But all and who's in the boat with you determines is if you can rest or not. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for who you are. Would you be honored and glorified today? Lord, as we simply move and have our being, I pray that you would allow us the opportunity to, in the midst of the storm to see you. Thank you for moms. Lord, as they simply go and celebrate, as we fellowship, may we acknowledge and be thankful and humble of who you are. So Jesus, would you be honored and glorified in how we responded, how we've heard today, what we've listened to. And may the receptivity find repentant hearts for your honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Just a few questions.